health exchanges, uh, which is supposed to help people. Uh, can you explain what that is? Sure. Well, I mean, one of the things, it, these will be state-run programs primarily. Um, as long as the states put a play, one in place, the federal government will kind of just stay out of the game a little bit. Um, but the, the idea being to have a, pl a place where a person can go to a health care, uh, uh, go to a, an insurance market and find uh, something that they can pair apples to apples. Um, right now, it's really hard to shop for insurance, as you could probably imagine, because it, we, most of us aren't used to actually reading insurance policies to find out whether or not uh, we're getting the right kinds of coverage or it's got all the things we want. And a health exchange would help us do that. Um, and so I think we're going to see uh, some, some of the states really implement that. It should help people find, at least shop for the insurance that they need. Now, uh, for people who are seniors right now, uh, the health exchange is not a new idea. Uh, in uh, Medicare Part D, uh, prescription drug coverage, uh, a, a person can call up the Senior Linkage Line, which is part of the Minnesota Board of Aging, and the Minnesota Senior Linkage Line will help you look at different companies and see what see what the policies are. Uh, they, they will ask you directly, you know, what, what drugs are you taking right now, what, what, what prescriptions are you taking right now, and, uh, and they'll see, you know, looking at different companies, uh, and, and what, the, what the price is. So that's really building upon this Medicare Part D. And uh, that was very, very helpful to me as, as, as a retiree to be able to go to the senior linkage line uh, to have help in that. So yeah. health, health exchanges, it's a marketplace, and this is to help guide you you, you can you can you can have some guidance as you as you go through the as you go through the market. Yeah, and certainly we want. I mean, these are all things that help control the cost in the system for everyone. Uh, we want people to get uh, uh, the drugs at the, the lowest possible price that they can get them at, um, so that they can uh, that the Medicare isn't paying for you know, the higher priced drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to keep giving opportunities to do that. And that's I mean one of the main concerns about um, the Affordable Care Act is whether we're doing enough in that uh, in that law to actually control the cost. This is an example where they're making some good strides forward. Now, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, how did our eight members of Congress vote for it? Well, I think you saw, uh, unfortunately, some, some party line type voting. That's, and one of the big concerns I've got, and one of the reasons I decided to run for Congress, is that we've got uh, folks who uh, mostly want to make their parties happy and not so much look at the bills that were, that were putting forward. And so my, my opponent, John Klein, was uh, opponent of, of Affordable Care Act. Uh, he's been uh, multiple votes to try to repeal it, as many of the other uh, Republican uh, congressmen and women have done. And I think that's a, you know, it doesn't seem to be so much along party lines as along, we want to stop the president from having any level of success or stop Democrats from having it. And now if you have that kind of a setup, you're going to find uh, you, you can really put cogs in the wheel and make sure it doesn't, the wheels don't spin in, in government. And we've got to have people who are ready to get back to work. So it's not just a case of people trying to get together and figure out the best way to serve the health needs of our, of our population, but it was, got, got down, down and dirty. It got tied up with all the, the mess that's going on in Washington right now, where these guys, all they want to do is fight rather than get yeah. anything done. So the Supreme Court came, came in in 2012, in, in the summer, summer of 2012, uh, because those who were opposed to the Affordable Care Act said it was not constitutional. Uh, uh, was somehow going against the uh, our, our base, basic framework of government. Uh, what was the ruling of the Supreme Court, and why, why is it uh, important that the Supreme Court ruled? Yeah, well, obviously it's like a 90-plus page decision, which I've had a chance to read, but uh, the long and the short of what came out is that they said that the plan could go forward as it was. It wasn't uh, something they could do under the Commerce Clause, but they can, they can implement these uh, the individual mandates. They can make sure that the coverage is there. Um, and so it's going forward. And I think uh, what you've seen in response to that is folks who are opposed to it try to make a political issue out of something that's now behind us. The Constitution says we can do it, apparently, according to our Supreme Court. And we ought to be moving forward on improving the law rather than now fighting over whether or not it should have been put in place in the first place. So it is going to be there, and uh, let's, let, let, let's, let's work with it. It is. And, and frank, frankly, I don't think the people in our country would go back on the things that the good parts of, of that bill. Making sure that your kids can stay on your health insurance until they're 26, people are not going to want to give that right up. Uh, making sure that pre-existing conditions don't preclude you from having uh, access to health care, people are not going to give that up. Closing this donut hole. Uh, those are things that the people, people really like and they need. We need those things. And so uh, I think uh, it would be 
pretty hard pressed to repeal the whole thing now. Those, those important components are going to be there going forward. And we need that mandate in there uh, to broaden the, the pool. You know, we can't just have sick people buying insurance. We have to have a, 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 broad, a broad pool. And that helps pay for these, for these very uh, popular parts of the Affordable Care Act. Right. So, okay. Uh, so we covered some, some big issues uh, on, on a kind of a global basis or a national basis. Uh, you've, you've been out door knocking this fall. You were out door knocking last, last summer and, and probably last spring as well. Uh, what, what issues uh, do voters want to talk to you about as, as, you, as, you, as you quite literally knock on their door? <laughs> well, as you would be uh, expecting, the, the kinds of the issues that the voters are talking to me about really center on a couple of different issues. One is making sure we're protecting Medicare as we know it, making sure that we uh, have a Social Security system that will actually be there. Um, those are, are crucial programs that people care deeply about, and they're part of this national uh, discussion that's going on now with Congressman Ryan being selected as uh, Governor Romney's vice president, uh, pr presidential nominee. Um, uh, and, and the discussion we're having at the door is essentially whether or not John Klein supports ending Medicare as we know it, which of course he does. Uh, the other big issue that, uh, that comes up uh, deals with jobs and making sure we've got a strong middle class. I'm a proponent of making sure that we uh, have a strong middle class that can generate jobs in our communities because when people have money in their pocket, they go spend it in our local communities uh, and then those businesses uh, need to hire workers to provide the services and the goods and that's how, we do, that's how job growth works and I uh, am looking forward to having that discussion with them. And then the third thing that really comes up a lot, and, and it's a discussion I'm happy to have, is we've got to get our costs under control in our government. We just can't, uh, we can't do everything for everyone. We have to decide what our priorities are and actually go forward and, and set those out. We, can't, uh, we have to root out any waste that's there, and we have to make sure that we uh, make sure everyone feels like they're getting good, good, good bang for the buck on their dollars that we send to our federal government. Okay, when you, when you mention cost containment, uh, uh, I've heard it said, you know, that the big, you know, the biggest place is in you know, de defense spending, which is, you know, we want the best defense possible, and that, that's a basic uh, reason for having government, uh, uh, along, along with just a few others. Uh, are there things that could be uh, modified in, 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 in a defense budget uh, with, that would not jeopardize our, our overall defense? Certainly. I mean, we, we've seen, you've probably seen reported examples of, of the two, arm, two branches of the military buying the same vehicle, so we have some redundancies. We've certainly had a couple of wars over the last decade, at least one of them that was a war of that we voluntarily chose as opposed to one that we had to go do. Mm -hmm. um, and so how we spend those military dollars is something that definitely we need to be analyzing. I, you know, I'm absolutely in favor of making sure our troops have everything they need. Uh, when those men and women go into the field, they, they, any tool they need to be successful, they should have. But we have to be wiser about where we go send them, uh, which we haven't done a good job of over the last couple decades. And we have to be smarter about how we spend the money when we're here to root out the waste. But it's not just in our military budgets either. I mean, we, there are redundancies in our state gov in our federal government that we have to get. There's Medicare fraud that we could save ten, you know, billions of dollars uh, on Medicare fraud if we could close the loops on those types of things. And we have to make sure that we uh, really root out those things. And it's not just because we don't want to waste money, but it's because the faith of people in our federal government d is determined by whether or not they think their money is being spent wisely. And so any example of waste, we should root out, we should eliminate. Um, Democrats aren't doing enough to root out that waste. Republicans, they do root out some waste and they hold it up like an example, but then they go and spend it on tax breaks for the, the richest among us. And uh, that's wasteful too. And so we need people who are going to be focusing in on, instead, you know, just like a laser beam, on making sure we get a government that works efficiently for us. You, you mentioned our men and women in uniform, and a picture comes to my mind of young men and young women, especially. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about another issue: uh, student aid, the, the loans that uh, loans that uh, people receive. Uh, to continue their schooling. Uh, what, what has happened on, 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 on student aid in the last uh, four years uh, in terms of uh, banks versus uh, uh, banks lo loaning money versus uh, uh, government o uh, oversight of, of loaning money? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously we've seen a, a, a big, there's a lot of concern in a lot of families in our district about whether or not we're going to be able to afford colleges, whether that's going to be a dream yeah. that can be done. Um, and we've seen folks like Congressman Klein be out there as a cheerleader for letting student loan interest rates double. 
um, so calling, you know, I think he called, uh, the Republicans at least have called that policy failed policy, student loan policy. Uh, by the way, they're fine with no strings attached, uh, bailouts going to banks and so forth, but our student loan policy has somehow failed. And, and I think that's just an example of where we've kind of got a priority wrong. It's a top-down approach that they're taking as opposed to a middle-out approach, a middle-class-out approach. Our middle-class families, they need those student loans to make sure their kids can be successful. And you know, when you look at the Paul Ryan budget and kind of what it does as a general thing, it shifts you know, $6,400 onto our seniors so that they can give tax breaks to the richest among us, another $265,000 to, to the richest among us. That's sort of a dynamic of taking money from the middle class and giving it off to the folks on the top end is just not going to work to be successful for our families. And the same is going to be true here with the student loan program. We have to make sure that these programs are there, uh, whether they're Pell Grants or student loans that are subsidized or available dollars to make sure that our kids can go get the education they need to be the 21st century workforce we need to be successful here. And if we are going to be competitive in this world, we, we need to have a well, uh, we need to have students who are well, well prepared and, uh, yeah. and we want to make that affordable for all of them. Uh, we're getting down to the last couple, three minutes. Uh, uh, any issue or issues that uh, we have not touched upon uh, that, 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 that you would like to mention right now? Yeah, well, I would just say, look, uh, you know, Washington is broken right now. Mm -hmm. We have got a system where uh, it seems like Democrats won't do enough to, to root out wasteful spending that's there, uh, that won't, they won't do enough to prioritize. Republicans aren't doing enough to, to uh, you know, make sure that the middle class has a successful opportunity. They just want to take, uh, shift the tax burden onto the middle class and help out a few folks at the very top end. Uh, that system where the goal is to stop each other from having success is the problem that we're having now. And folks like John Klein who are part of that are the cause of that problem. And it's our job now to make sure we put people in Congress who want to make sure we're successful in this country. They want to make sure our kids are innovative and creative and have the entrepreneurial attitude that it takes to be successful in a 21st century economy. That means investing in things like education, not undercutting it or not leaving no child left behind in place because uh, Congressman Klein doesn't want to have the president have any success. We have to do these things if we're going to move forward. And we need people in, in Congress who are willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. That's why I'm running. Very good. And at this point, I have to call us to a close. Our award-winning director, uh, Roger Carlson, and, and his crew, uh, today's crew, Larry Chadwick and, and Ed Rapp, are telling me to, to wrap this up. So we thank you for joining us today, uh, taking a really good look at Social Security, Medicare, and the Affordable Care Act. And uh, you have a sound understanding of these issues. And, uh, uh, and these, are, these are issues that are of special importance to retirees. So please join us for, for discussions on other public policy issues affecting union retirees. So Voices of Experience is brought to you by the Minnesota State Retiree Council, AFL-CIO.